certificates because they were afraid that their eyesight would be damaged. And I'll never forget as we're right, everybody cheered when they come. This is 2.30 in the morning. And everybody cheered and all the rest of it. And uh, one of the men, I'm not sure which one, sat up, threw the blanket off and gave us the, the V for victory. <coughs> Sorry. God, I don't know why this still affects me this way. It really does. It's incredible. Well, it was so traumatic. And not only that, but now the story, it doesn't end there. But I had befriended uh, a young man, and I forget his name now. I wish I knew his name. And his uncle was one of those, actually, who was killed, who was not rescued. And uh, so I, I, I got to know them very well. I got to know the families. Uh, in one case, I remember I went to the home, and they had already purchased the coffin. And uh, they had cleared out the, uh, the, the living room, because this is where many of the funerals were held. And uh, it was one of the ones who was rescued. So you can imagine the trauma involved in that. And then we went to the hospital. Now, one of the most poignant stories, and this, this is a story that was exclusive. Let me, let me just, husbands are gone. There was, there, don't forget, there's 94 down there, OK? So they rescue 12. So and, and most people at this point give up. This has been a solid week. The men obviously would be injured. There's no water. There's no food, etc. So hope is abandoned virtually. Most of the press goes home. In fact, as far as I know, I, I think everybody from the press went home. By the way, one of the visitors to the site was Prince Philip. He came over from, from Britain and uh, to try and raise some money and so forth. But so we, we now, after they've discovered these men, the 12 and all the joy and everything else, we've got 12 people rescued. The press essentially goes home. I stayed for another day because I still had some hope. And uh, United Press International, it was, I was costing them so little they could keep me there for a little bit longer. So the press was set up in, in, the, in a sort of an office headquarters. And uh, they, they just accommodated us everywhere. I had a little um, uh, mattress that was on the floor. I slept on the floor. And it was pretty primitive, the communications. The only means of communication I had then was a phone. And I had to shout. The connection was very bad. So I had to, I had to dictate my stories on the telephone, shouting into the phone back to Montreal. And I had, I had a number of, of first-rate stories. I had the front page of the New York Times, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so we've got the 12 men rescued one week later. This is a, a great miracle. Now, the press, most of it goes home. I wait a day. And then I, I drive back, get a cab back to Moncton to catch a plane the next morning. At 4 o'clock in the morning, about 4.30, I get a call from this friend of mine, the, man that, the young man that I had befriended. He said, Lowell, they have found some more. So this is an international scoop for me. I immediately uh, phoned uh, UPI. This is about quarter to 5 in the morning and said they have found more. We're not sure how many. And so I immediately rushed back, and I essentially had the whole thing to myself. They found six more men still alive, uh, which was a, a double miracle. Now, the, the most incredible story of all in this, James, is the Hunter brothers. And we have to take a break here. I want to talk to, uh, to the, my listeners and uh, to the people in, this, in the interview about one of the most incredible stories about twin brothers. We'll be back on CFRA. I, gotta, I have to tell you, and this will be the last on Spring Hill, the Hunter brothers. The Hunter brothers are twins. They are working together uh, at about the 13,000-foot level. Uh, Wilfred, and you know, for the life of me, I cannot remember the other brother's name, although I think it was Frank. I think it was Fred and Frank. Now, Wilfred was among those 12 rescued the first time. He was very seriously injured. Uh, he, gangrene set in in his leg. He was an absolute utter pain for the entire week that he was down there. And when they rescued him, they immediately, I'll never forget, the helicopter came and flew him out to another hospital. He did survive. But uh, before he left, I talked with him, and he was, he was, I mean, just terrible. He believed that his twin brother, working beside him, was killed and was pinned to the roof above him. For seven days, he lay there, and he could reach up to the, to the roof by now very close and feel this body pinned to the roof. And he talked to him because he thought it was his brother. He was talking to him even though he knew he was dead. Lo and behold, if his brother, Frank, wasn't one of the six rescued, it was not his brother above him. It was another man whose name we, we don't know. But the two of them, the twins, survived. One of the most dramatic stories in the entire episode. Wow. Yeah. That's wild. Wild. I believe in that. Yeah. Thank now, I, uh, I believe that they're both dead now. I talked with them. Um, a magazine called Man's Magazine, which no longer exists, uh, asked me to write a story for them, which I did. And uh, for that, I, I, I interviewed Wilfred again, and he remembered me. 
and um, we had a long chat, and he was doing fine, and his brother wasn't wasn't seriously injured at all, very badly dehydrated, as you can imagine. But there were many, many, uh, you know, wonderful stories there. The Maurice Ruddick, the singing miner who sang the whole time for nine days. These, these uh, last six were there for nine days, if you can imagine, trapped there. Seventy-five men in all lost their lives at Spring Hill. I went back um, about three years ago. I couldn't even see the site of the mine. I, I, I don't know what they have done there. I, I thought that there would be a monument. The monument, in fact, to the men is not at the mine head. It's uptown. And there is a museum, and uh, the big major story that I wrote for United Press International is the main story, the big feature story, that's at the museum in Spring Hill today. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's my recollection of Spring Hill. And I got back to UPI, and uh, I was a great hero. We had, as I say, uh, all sorts of, of scoops, uh, international scoops, front pages of newspapers all around. And don't forget these wire services, great competition against each other. And uh, they gave me the big bonus of $50. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one, 50 bucks! <laughs> one, one more question. Yes, sir. One more question on, on yes. the Spring Hill. Yeah. From what you, I always ask this question at the end of the interviews, from what you saw and what you learned yes. from that experience, do you have any words of wisdom for young people? Don't go into coal mining. <laughs> um, never underestimate the strength of the human spirit. That would be my message. You know, sometimes when you do the kind of show that I do here, James, you get, you get cynical. Sometimes people don't respond, and I get a little mad sometimes, which is kind of foolish. But in the end, when challenged, there's a lot of people who will meet that challenge. 400 people, draggermen, they brought them in from uh, all, essentially all over North America to, to, re to do search and rescue. Even office workers and so forth risked their lives in order to save these men at Spring Hill. So never underestimate the human spirit. Thank you.